Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar of the Geographical Sciences Committee of the United States National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Our speakers today are Mary Price, who will discuss the ethical dimensions of using geospatial tools to address societal challenges, and Elizabeth Root, who will examine geospatial considerations for community-based contract tracing. This is the fourth and final webinar in a series organized by the GSC on ethics and biases in the geographical sciences. My name is Budu Haduri, and I'm a, I'm a member of the Geographical Sciences Committee, and I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, just a quick few details before we get started. Mary and Elizabeth will each speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will hold a question and answer session for the remainder of the time. We will be taking questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Please type your question in the box at any time and click send. And I will be picking those questions from there at the end. The webinar is being recorded. Please understand that any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. A link to the recording as well as a copy of the slides will be posted on our website within the week. If you have any technical issues during this event, please contact Zoom support at 1-888-799-9666, extension two. Before I turn it over to today's speakers, I just want to say a few words about the Geographical Sciences Committee. Next slide, please. We are a standing committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. The National Academies are not-for-profit organizations with a dual mission to honor the nation's top scientists and to provide objective, independent advice on science, technology, engineering, and medicine. Established at the direction of President Lincoln, the National Academies have been providing these services to the country for over 150 years. Next slide, please. The Geographical Sciences committee provides at all levels using the methods of spatial analysis and representation. We address the geographic dimensions of human environment interactions, spatial location and concentration, and place based research and policy at all spatial scales. The committee also fosters international cooperation by serving as a liaison to the national international geographical organizations including the official US liaison to the International Geographical Union. The committee is supported by funding from the National Science Foundation. Next slide, please. Here is the current membership of the Geographical Sciences Committee and I am one of the members on this committee right now. Next slide, please. Here are some of the geographical issues the committee has tackled in the last three years and you can come to our website to find more details about our meetings and open discussions. Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Mary Price is a professor of geography and international affairs at George Washington University, where she has taught since 1990. A Latin American and migration specialist, her studies have explored human migration's impact on development and social change. She has been president of the American Geographical Society since 2016. Her current research is on the spatial dynamics of immigrant inclusion and exclusion in cities. She is also interested in participatory mapping and open source platforms as a way to engage students in research service and analysis. In 2017, Mary participated in an UN expert group on sustainable cities, human mobility and international migration. And in 2018, she gave the keynote at the UN Commission on Population and Development. She is co-authored to two leading textbooks in world geography, Diversity Amid Globalization, World Regions, Environment and Development, which is in its seventh edition, and Globalization and Diversity, Geography of a Changing World, which is in its sixth edition. Her publications also include a co-authored report, Migrants, Inclusion in Cities, Innovative Urban Policies and Practices, co-edited book, Migrants to the Metropolis, 
the rise of immigrant gateway cities, and over 60 refereed articles and book chapters. Mary earned her graduate degrees in geography at Syracuse University and her undergraduate degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Elizabeth Root is a professor in the geography department and the division of epidemiology at the Ohio State University. Dr. Root also has affiliations with the Translational Data Analytics Program and the Institute for Population Research. Her research and teaching focus on the intersection between geography and public health, where she explores geographic patterns of health and disease using quantitative spatial methodologies. Her current research focuses on three broad topics. One, social dimensions of health and the ways in which population and environment factors jointly impact human health and well-being Two, community level factors which impact maternal and child health with a focus on maternal opioid misuse and three the evaluation of place-based health interventions using geospatial analysis geographical information systems and large administrative data sources dr root actively engages with local and state government to explore ways in which state data resources can mostly most effectively be used to inform policy and target health programs. Most recently, she began working with innovative Innovate Ohio to utilize a multi-agency platform which integrates administrative data sources from health, welfare, public safety, and the judicial systems to help the state develop data-driven responses to the opioid epidemic. Elizabeth has several major international health projects in Bangladesh, Honduras, Philippines, and Indonesia as well as two research initiatives in the United States. She received her BA in anthropology and public policy analysis from Pomona College and her MA and PhD in geography from the University of Maryland and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill respectively. With that, I'm going to turn it over. <clears throat> but before that, a last reminder that if you have any difficulty in technical issues, contact Zoom support at 1-888-799 9666 extension 2. And you can subscribe to the future GSC events at the website that you can find on the slide. Um, I would like to um, turn it over to Mary for her presentation now. Mary, it's over to you. Thank you, Budu. And welcome everyone who's uh, listening. Um, I am Marie Price, the president of the American Geographical Society, and today I want to talk about a, a program we began a year and a half ago called Ethical Geo, and particularly a, an initiative that began this spring, um, our Location Tech Task Force. Um, so let's begin. First of all, uh, um, those of you who are not familiar with the American Geographical Society, we're actually the the oldest geographical society in the United States. We were established in 1851 in New York City. We have always tried to occupy a, an intersection between government, business, academia, and um, um, education. And, and as a result, our membership is often from these diverse sectors. Um, it's not strictly an academic organization. Um, but we believe by bringing people together in the same way that the National Academy does from, from these different sectors, there's a chance to have um, uh, deep conversations and also affect policy and make sure that geographical research and sciences can be used to improve people's lives. Next slide. So um, our research team, uh, the leadership at the AGS, some familiar faces. Uh, Vice Senior Vice President is Alec Murphy, who's been on the GSC. Uh, John Konarski, a PhD from Syracuse, although not in geography, is a long career in business. He's our um, executive director. And Chris Tucker, a PhD from Columbia, um, who has uh, worked in government and the private sector. And so uh, in this leadership team, in addition, we have a, a robust Council from government, academia, and business who, who help advise us. Next slide. I put this up because we are an organization that's been around for a long time. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, our director was a man named Isaiah Bowman. And uh, Bowman um, 
had an influential career. He was tapped by Woodrow Wilson to lead the inquiry, which was a massive uh, American initiative in remapping and reimagining Europe after World War I. Um, and then he was later Roosevelt's geographer and then it later became president of uh, Johns Hopkins University. And this quote, while it's not exactly gender neutral, um, I think the point is to a revolutionary degree, man changes geography as he goes along, all geography is always new. And that is so important because there is this pervasive vision that geography is something you learn in sixth grade and that you're done. Um, and one of the things that I encourage my students to do is to, to think in maps, to think about how the map is always changing, how there are alternative maps, uh, what asking questions about who's creating these maps, whether the data are out there. And certainly the geospatial revolution has made um, geography uh, available to everyone in their pocket when they have a cell phone and they use um, location tracking um, and mapping devices. So um, I think it's an easy case to make, but I don't know if we make it as well as we should. And certainly being engaged in this discussion on, of ethics is a way of, of bringing the relevance of geographic change um, to a broader public. Next slide. So just as a, a quick reminder, some of the ways that we reach out to the public in the AGS is we have the geographical review. It was preceded by the geographical bulletin. So the society has been publishing uh, uh, this journal for 130 years. Um, but we also have some interesting online uh, sources. Focus on Geography is a digital magazine that has been um, um, available open source. Um, and and um, I invite you to look, out, look it over. And then to uh, educators and our members, especially AP Human Geography teachers, we send out a daily geo, which is a Monday through Friday, kind of geography in the news, a way to start class and uh, connect um, what you're learning in your books to what's happening in the world. And then of course, the usual uh, social media presence of, of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next slide. So the Ethical Geo Project began uh, about a year and a half ago. We received uh, funds from the Omidyar Network. And our idea was to activate people with interest in geography, whether they're um, um, computer scientists, entrepreneurs, policy makers, practitioners, students, um, to submit their ideas about what would be examples of ethical projects in geography, geography for good as a shorthand, and also concerns they have about how geospatial information and big data could be blended in ways that could be um, quite concerning. And one of the interesting things when we launched this campaign um, is that we decided rather than use a more conventional uh, proposal, written proposal, people submitted a three minute video of what their project was an idea. We had over 200 submissions and it was a, a really creative and kind of liberating way uh, to, uh, to read about and learn about um, what people's ideas and concerns were. Next slide. So when we began Ethical Geo, and again, this was in early 2019, these were some of our primary concerns. Um, obviously privacy is a huge concern for everybody and especially with um, real-time location tracking, uh, this was uh, certainly a concern. Um, in terms of politics, we were very interested in how governments use data, uh, especially in, in mapping, but informing policy, but also um, how governments could regulate um, the private sector and, and its use of data. And, and uh, these discussions obviously go well beyond geography, but that was some of our concerns. We also, believe that there was enormous potential um, with open source platforms for uh, empowering communities that seek social change, seek justice, to create alternative maps. 
And um, we wanted to make sure that uh, these voices and these tools would um, be widely available. So we've partnered closely with Youth Mappers, which is an organization funded by USAID and uh, my university, George Washington, was also one of the founding members. We also see this um, geospatial tools are critical for encouraging uh, a more sustainable planet, monitoring um, climate change. Um, and so this geographic inquiry, these new geographies that we're creating are certainly uh, one of our uh, interests. And lastly, and this is a, a concern, especially in the Omidyar family, about property rights and how geospatial tools could be used for um, people to be able to, especially in informal settings and in, informal neighborhoods, um, to stake claim to their territories and, and use that to formalize informal ownership. Next slide, please. So uh, after we received all these videos, uh, we selected um, uh, seven ethical geo fellows who have been working with us for the last year. Um, the, in fact, a couple of the ethical geo fellows have even spoken uh, to this um, committee and I'll show you their images in just a minute. Um, but again, with the con dual concerns of how geographical tools can be used for good, um, social justice, um, greater equity, but also what are the ethical concerns and who controls the data. And um, we began this before COVID and uh, our ethical geo fellows joined us that we have an annual meeting at Columbia University called Geography 2050. We did a pre-workshop where all the fellows um, presented their work, initial ideas, and we've been following up with them, but unfortunately in a more of a virtual setting as, um, as uh, COVID has changed everybody. Um, you can go to the Ethical Geo website. If you just Google one word Ethical Geo, it'll come up. There are blogs, there's information on the fellows process and then also um, um, the location tech work, which I'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. Uh, so here are some of our Ethical Geo fellows, the work they're doing, it's a range of people. Uh, you already met uh, David. He spoke last session, I believe. He does a lot of work on open mapping in Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Alfredo Hironava is very interested in um, coastal fishing communities and reducing poverty. William Evans has work um, in Tanzania on property rights and Greg Babinski's project is looking at uh, GIS and uh, technology in the city of Seattle. Next slide. And uh, uh, three other ethical geo fellows. Again, we had seven. Uh, Erica Hagen was one of the leaders in Map Kabira. So she's very interested in community mapping and open source platforms. Dara Seidel, who's worked, um, uh, spoke to this committee as well, um, is interested in masking location and, and, and training young people of how to not necessarily have all your movements tracked. And, Father Michael Frazier, who's a professor at St. Louis University and a public health um, professor, uh, is very interested in uh, the relationship between humans and their data, uh, and the ethical concerns about who, who owns data and what does it mean to people, and is doing some very interesting survey work on these ethical questions. So um, the fellows were funded to, to work with us, to collaborate together, but also um, to um, produce work that would um, inform a, a broader understanding of ethics and geography. Next slide. So as our world seemed to turn rather dramatically uh, this uh, spring with the advent of COVID, um, we, uh, in, in collaboration with the Henry Luce Foundation, decided to begin the Location Tech Task Force, um, which is ongoing. And what I'm going to present today is some of our preliminary findings. Next slide. So um, the Henry Luce Foundation, um, uh, Luce was a journalist owned Time uh, Inc. And um, the, or, the foundation is concerned about improving public discourse, awareness of science, uh, influencing policy and leadership. And it's worth mentioning that the current president of the Luce Foundation is uh, Dr. 
Mariko Silver, who has a PhD in geography uh, from UCLA. She's an economic geographer, but she also had a distinguished career in government. She worked for the Department of Homeland Security, looking at international policy, and then was president of um, uh, Burlington College in Vermont. Uh, did I say Burlington? Bennington, I meant. Um, so she has this, her feet and experience in academia and government, and then this social sector. So as um, uh, the foundation was thinking about ways to uh, respond to COVID and where, uh, what is, it's a massive issue, uh, but what would be a thin slice, an area that maybe people um, had not focused as much on, um, the location tech was an area of tremendous concern. Um, meaning as, as the, the various tech companies, Apple and Google talked about rolling out location tech tracking devices. What would that really mean for privacy? Who would own this data? And um, which seemed like it was a way for a geographic community to contribute a small slice, but we think an important slice of information of understanding the response to COVID. And the belief is that these technologies uh, as they advance, maybe wouldn't end with COVID, but could continue. And, and this was especially of interest and concern to us as an organization. Next slide. So how do we go about doing this? Well, um, we of course knew we were gonna be doing this virtually. Um, and so we decided to create uh, blue ribbon panels and leadership spotlights. And this in, uh, both involved a lot of phone work using our networks. Again, we have a council that's diverse in terms of participation from government, business, academia. Um, we reached out to people and, and there was enormous interest. Uh, we, especially the human rights community, community um, uh, people concerned with legal aspects of privacy, um, ethicists, um, technologists, and um, as we talked to people, uh, we developed a variety of themes. I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, to begin to think about what are the consequences of this technology? Who are the vulnerable publics? How has it been used before? Um, what is its relevance to COVID? And uh, then we also decided to actually do some spotlights where rather than a panel setting, we uh, would interview one individual. The Blue Ribbon panels are quite involved. They're uh, online. You can register for them um, or watch them on Facebook Live. Um, the way they work is that the, the panelists, there could be three to five, do a formal presentation. Then there's questions among the panelists led by the moderator and then the public can also ask questions. So we see these not so much as entertainment, but a type of testimony of getting the issues out there um, and, and making people aware of some of the potential concerns. And interestingly, we found that Facebook Live has been a really important forum. Uh, people can find it in several of our panels. Um, hundreds of people have viewed it. So, um, and, but we also have them recorded and available on um, our website. Next slide. So, so far we have done three panels. Um, the hardest thing about doing a panel is getting people to commit to a three hour period to participate. And also these are people from all over the world. So timing is, is challenging. And, and that's with COVID with a lot of people at home. So I can't imagine how we would have pulled this off in a, a non-COVID environment. Uh, but next week we have a really uh, fantastic panel on national security perspectives. Um, and you can see other ones, state and local experience, data quality, and building trust um, and a research spotlight from the Belfer Center at Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government. Um, and then we have three more panels that we hope to um, set up um, all in August. We wanna finish the panels and data collecting uh, by before the end of August. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about some of the, the panels and how they were structured and what we've learned uh, to date. And again, this is an ongoing uh, project and we welcome um, uh, people listening to attend the meetings and participate. Um, the Location Tech Task Force, the Blue Ribbon Panel on Vulnerable Publics, the international group, we had uh, many speakers that 
live internationally. Um, there were two really compelling uh, reports on what's being done in uh, the Gulf states in terms of a pretty advanced surveillance state, um, especially since many of the Gulf countries have large, um, in fact, the majority of their populations are immigrants and, and their mo movement has long been tracked. Um, so some of these uh, practices certainly preceded COVID and um, and and sort of the, the and intensified with COVID. Um, there was some very interesting discussion on LGBTQ rights and how uh, vulnerable publics, uh, as a vulnerable public, where their um, movements and what would be safe places might no longer be safe. And then uh, concerns about uh, children in, in particular and their levels of vulnerability. Um, so that was a, a robust discussion that um, brought in a, a diversity of, of viewpoints. Next slide. And then we had a, a, a very, very insightful panel uh, on vulnerable publics in the US. Um, and it started off with uh, Dr. Charlton McElwin, who is uh, Vice Provost at um, NYU. And he made the point, especially um, among uh, African Americans in the US, that they've seen this narrative before, uh, a crisis is declared, whether it's the war on drugs, uh, the war on crime, um, the fighting COVID, uh, new technologies have been introduced and uh, surveillance and in some cases, uh, repression has uh, been advanced. Similarly, groups that are looking and working with immigrants and Native Americans have some similar concerns. So that um, um, the, the sort of narrative that um, these technologies could be um, uh, securely managed and, um, and privacy respected uh, was um, in doubt by many of the panelists. At the same time, they saw possibilities of how it could be used well, um, but were very skeptical of uh, the control either by government or the private sector. Next slide. Um, I made these points already, but uh, one of the themes that came up, um, especially with international, is these regimes where there's uh, digital repressive technology already exists. Um, and examples um, from China, uh, from facial recognition to, to tracking of Uyghurs, um, to many examples in the, the Gulf states. Um, at the same time, there have been governments and liberal democracies, uh, Norway, for example, that initially just tried the mobile location tracking system and then ceased it because they weren't convinced that um, privacy would be uh, respected. Um, there were also some interesting examples of um, uh, Singapore probably do, using location tech in a very responsible way. Um, in the US context, we still have some more reporting to do, um, but certainly for um, ethnic minorities and immigrant groups, there was more concern than enthusiasm for this technology. Next slide. So a week ago, we invited Ambassador Samantha Power uh, for a spotlight. And um, she was the ambassador to the UN uh, the last four years of the Obama administration. And before that, she served on the National Security Council. And um, one of the interesting things we talked about was um, she was at, at the UN during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa from 2014 and 2016, which uh, was suppressed. And I asked her to make comparisons to that experience. Um, it was an epidemic, not a pandemic, but she highlighted the uh, international collaboration um, and, um, and also the support of both UN and uh, WHO um, how number of countries were supplying technology resources. And then when she said she looked at COVID today, um, there was no clear leadership. Um, the US is, um, is not really cooperating with major international organizations. And moreover, on a sort of up higher level, she said that the polarization in the US at this moment, the, the political polarization, the attack on science, 
the dual sets of facts that seem to operate exclusively from each other uh, makes a response to COVID extremely difficult. Um, and that's not even taking the technology into consideration. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we are um, going to do after gathering this data is we're partnering with um, Benchmark, which is an organization in the UK, uh, to develop what we call the Locust Charter to try and come up with ethical standards of how such data could be used. And this, this is just beginning. We're still in the data collection, but um, the, the uh, the end goal is to come up with some guidelines and we would welcome people's uh, comments and input as this goes forward. Next slide. So there's uh, some time for questions later. I just wanted to say that the, the concern with location tech is a small slice of a, a really big questions that COVID bring in terms of uh, public health and, and the economic consequences and even the political consequences. But I think in taking this uh, small slice, uh, shrinking the changes at war, uh, there is space for geography and geographical sciences to make a really important contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, we are gonna transition quickly to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to do is, um, Oh, start my video. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> the host asked me to. Um, what I would like to do is um, uh, take some of that wonderful um, thoughts on ethical and um, use of geographic data and bias and whatnot, and, and put this into context into some of the work that I've been doing over the last three months with the Ohio Department of Health around contact tracing. Um, I've been working um, pretty hard for the last three months trying to help um, my state, I'm at um, the Ohio State University, but trying to help my state figure out ways to use data to better understand what is um, happening with the epidemiology of COVID across the state. And one of the deep concerns is contact tracing and how do we uh, try to control something, um, this disease that doesn't have a vaccine, doesn't have therapeutics yet, how do we try to keep it contained in the absence of any medical technology that helps us do that? And contact tracing is one of the main tools that we have at our disposal for doing that. So um, next slide. So at its very core, contact tracing is a process by which you identify people who are infected with some disease, in this case, COVID, and then you do some form of tracing or monitoring the contacts that they've had to try to contain or control the spread of disease. And so um, I really like this graphic. Um, the Seattle Times posted it a couple of weeks ago in their publication. But if you start with individual um, number three there who, has a, uh, who is positive for COVID and receives medical care and we identify them, um, contact tracers essentially then ask that person, you know, who were you in contact with? Um, and, um, you know, how can I contact that person? Can you provide me information for how to contact that person? And so contact tracers then go through this process of contacting those folks and asking them a series of questions about whether or not they've had symptoms and whatnot, um, encouraging them to go get tested. Um, and through this process, we do what we call box in the disease. We identify networks through which disease um, might spread and we box them in so that we can isolate them so that there's not continued spread. So typically the way that contact tracing is done is it's a form of social network analysis, right? So you take the person who's been identified with COVID and you ask them about their social networks and you construct um, a, a, basically a disease network through this investigation process. Um, and so that's what that's the sort of status quo. That's what we've been using um, for decades now in order to box in diseases that we're trying to control in populations. Next slide, please. So much of what we know about contact tracing actually comes from the HIV epidemic. Um, contact tracing was not uh, highly utilized prior to the 1980s when HIV became a real issue. And again, this was a disease that had no cure, still has no cure. Um, there weren't therapeutics in the 80s. We now have therapeutics for folks with HIV who are HIV positive. 
And so there was a necessity to contact trace in order to box in or contain the disease, similar to what we're seeing today with COVID. This disease, however, spreads through sexual networks, of course, through physical contact. And so what we're challenged by today is what if we have a disease that is not just transmitted through personal contacts, a disease that spread through the air or through contaminated inanimate objects like doorknobs and desks. And that's what we're facing with COVID today is that we have a disease that a majority of experts believe is spread through micro droplets in the air or through contaminated inanimate objects. And so contact tracing may need to change. We now really need to know where a person went, not just who within their social network they interacted with. And so this calls for a need to incorporate geographical contacts into the traditional social network type contact tracing that's been done traditionally with other diseases like HIV. Next slide, please. We also know that mobility plays a very key role in the transmission of COVID-19. So on the left here is actually a transmission map that was created that shows from, um, it's actually from a study that was done in Singapore. It shows how COVID-19 was imported initially from an index case, um, which was linked back to Wuhan, China. Um, and that's the yellow dots, right? These are Wuhan travelers and they came to Singapore and they went to a church service. And then they actually um, transmitted the disease to those folks in that church service one of those folks then went to another church um, or a family gathering um, and transmitted the disease there. And so it was actually transmitted through a series of contexts in specific locations. And so what we see from these types of transmission maps is that the spread of disease happens through co-location in space, not just social networks. So geography plays an inherent and extraordinarily important role in the transmission of COVID-19 um, that we don't necessarily see with diseases like HIV um, or even diseases that are harder to tr transmit like, um, um, uh, well, things like E. coli, which is a, where a lot of contact tracing goes into as well. Next slide, please. There is one study that's actually been done and it was done with the first SARS. So COVID-19 is also called SARS-CoV-2 because it's sort of a second generation of, um, of SARS that um, we're seeing. So a lot of uh, several years ago, when SARS the first was um, was one of was was um, circulating around Southeast Asia, there were a series of studies that were done to look at how it was transmitted, and this is actually one of the ones that came out of that. Um, and what this group of researchers did is they actually studied geographic contexts as well as social contexts to explore how the combination of both actually transmitted to the disease. So they included geographical locations that people with, with SARS-CoV-1 had as nodes, and then they also included the social network. Um, and so what you see on the right is actually the contact network. And what this did, did is actually increased the number of contacts that occurred about tenfold. So adding that geographic component increased the contact network exponentially, actually. And this is really important because this type of understanding of both the place-based transmission as well as the social network-based transmission allows us to visualize the role that location plays in disease transmission. It actually allows us to understand bridges between geographic locations so we understand how the disease jumps from small population to small population within our larger communities. Um, and so it also allows us to understand how it gets into one social network from a totally different social network. So this type of combination and bringing in geography in place is really important to our understanding of, of the dynamics of disease transmission, especially for something like COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what this tells us is that the way that we've been doing contact tracing is extraordinarily labor intensive for a disease like COVID-19. Um, the CDC and the Harvard Global Public Health Institute has estimated that you need about one contact tracer per thousand population. So where I live in Columbus, Ohio, um, you know, we have almost a million people now. It means that you'd need a small army of a thousand contact tracers to sort of keep up with the load and contact trace and call all of those people to be effective at boxing in the disease. This is, um, 
This is a challenge because contact tracing in the way that we do it now is less effective when you have a disease that has a really high asymptomatic rate. COVID-19, we think the asymptomatic rate is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent because you wouldn't even call and contact those people and try to box them in. Um, it's really less effective with a, a disease that has a long pre-symptomatic period. And for COVID, it's somewhere between seven, um, seven and 14 days, a pre-symptomatic period. Um, because again, those people can be out and about and they can be infecting folks and not even know that they have the disease. Um, it's also very, very difficult in high population density areas. Um, so my example of Columbus, Ohio with, with um, almost a million people, the, the, the amount of contact tracing that needs to go on because the transmission is higher in high density areas is a monumental undertaking. So that means that it's been very difficult to effectively trace um, geographic or place-based contacts. Um, when a contact tracer calls, they ask about people you've interacted with, but can you imagine them asking you, can you recall all of the places you've been to? Um, and how then do contact tracers figure out who else was at those locations? So if I tell the contact tracer, well, sure, I went to um, the Giant Eagle grocery store down the road um, twice last week. Think of all of the other people that I could have infected during my time in that grocery store and how in the world would a contact tracer even figure out who those folks are? Next slide. So one of the um, solutions that has been posed to tackle the challenge of contact tracing under COVID-19 is digital contact tracing. And this is a way, um, it's been proposed as a way to basically automate the collection of contact data using some form of a smartphone app. Um, next slide. Um, the, the base idea behind this is that you, you, if you have a smartphone with the application loaded onto your smartphone and you give it the correct permissions and everything, phones send out regular Bluetooth pings to nearby devices. And if another phone stays within six feet of you for more than 15 minutes, those phones exchange a code. And then if a smartphone owner actually tests positive and you put that into the app and say, yes, I have tested positive, your app would then send an alert to the other devices that you exchanged codes with in the past you know, seven days or something like that, and alert that person that they may have been exposed to somebody who was COVID positive. Um, if allowed, um, health providers or local public health agencies could have access to that data too, so that they could roll that into the contact tracing that is currently going on in a, in a more traditional manner. As you can see, this might be a much more effective way of tracing geographic contacts than trying to call people and ask where they'd been and then figure out who else had been in those locations. Next slide, please. So this is uh, actually from an article that was published in Science about hmm, a month ago by Ferretti and his colleagues. And this shows you how this works, right? So day one, um, somebody, uh, person A is at home and they're with person B, their smartphone app is on. Um, and then they get on the train and they sit next to person C and D for more than 15 minutes. And then they go to work. And at work, they have a bunch of colleagues, E, F, and G, that are close by to them, maybe in the cubicles right surrounding them. And then you have H and I who are actually nearby, but maybe not within six feet. And then that person goes home again. Um, the next day, that person wakes up with a fever and they report their symptoms and they request a test, or maybe they go get tested and they find that they're positive. And then what happens is an instant signal is sent from their phone through the app to the other individuals, a B, C, D, E, F, and G, who they were in close proximity to for a long period of time, um, and says and tells those folks that, hey, you might be able to, um, you, you might want to go get tested, or you need to self-isolate, or you need to monitor yourself. And in this article, they showed actually that um, the growth rate of the disease would actually decline. Um, if something like this was enacted. Um, they did a geosimulation. It was a really interesting article. I encourage folks to read it. Next slide. So it has actually been brought up, of course, that there are deep privacy concerns for digital contact tracing. And it is based on two different technologies that have been suggested. I, I gave you the Bluetooth um, example, but there's also a GPS example. Um, so there are some apps out there that collect location data and it alerts users that have been in geographic proximity. Um, so it actually um, stores and uses geographic proximity information to then send out that alert to other people that you might have exposed if you were to become positive. 
this methodology, it's quite difficult to maintain the privacy of users. Um, geographic location is, is stored and used actively as part of those applications. And of course, many of us understand that you can algorithmically determine place of residence if you have that kind of information available. It's relatively easy to identify a person. And so the GPS apps have brought up a tremendous number of privacy concerns because of the way that they store and maintain and use data, and in particular, geographic data. The Bluetooth option was suggested as a, um, as a methodology where there's better, safeguard of better safeguarding of privacy. And that's because the phone app stores a code based on your you know, sort of everyday interactions and, and no locations at all. And so the user also can therefore control the personal information that's put into the app. Um, and, and it just is, it, it has been proposed as a method to um, do something similar, but not um, uh, perhaps pr retain the privacy um, within this system. Next slide. So one of the reasons we need to consider how these apps are developed and how to maintain privacy is that polls by and large show that there's not a tremendous wave of support for digital contact tracing. Um, there was a, a survey done by the Brookings Institute about a month ago that asked people, what's the likelihood that you would download and use a hypothetical contact tracing app? Um, and you can see that um, uh, you know, a good 40%, depending on um, what racial group you look at, said that they would be un extremely unlikely to use something like this. And then an additional basically 25% said that they would be somewhat likely or ambivalent about it. Um, and really only about 20% of the population was very, was, was very supportive of such, um, such an application. Uh, researchers at uh, Royal Institute in Oxford and, uh, and Harvard have suggested that you need at least 60% of the population to use the app in order for it to be effective in decreasing um, COVID transmission. Next slide. And in addition, there was another survey that was done um, where they asked why basically you wouldn't use the app. And the biggest concern actually uh, over the COVID contact tracing apps was about digital privacy or trust of, of how their data would be used by the application providers. Next slide. So there are lots of challenges inherent in using um, digital data um, to uh, help us with contact tracing for COVID-19. And I put them into sort of implementation and ethics and bias. So the implementation side is that, you know, to get something like this up and going, there needs to be fairly large social mobilization and mass marketing media campaigns um, for public adoption of these things. And we haven't seen that. And that's largely because we haven't seen a sustained federal response in support of these. And some states have tried and other states like my own have not been interested at all in a digital contract tracing app. Um, and there needs to be a way of building and sustaining public trust on the intentions of how these data are being used and how um, privacy is going to be preserved because that's clearly an issue. Um, the other big thing is that I don't know how many of you have looked at digital contact tracing apps, but there's, I would say, um, 20 different ones that have been fully developed and are being marketed to different organizations out there right now. And you can't have 20 different applications. You need to have a cohesive and coherent response um, because you need to get to that 60% of the population. Um, and again, in, in, the, in the absence of a strong federal response and a, a strong federal leadership on this, we've seen this burgeoning of apps um, from all sorts of different companies uh, that want to uh, move this technology forward. Um, and then the other challenge, of course, is how do you prevent hacking and other unauthorized access and use of this data? Because this is protected health information and, and is uh, probably one of the most private pieces of information you maintain on yourself. Next slide. And the other challenge that I see is ethics and bias. There are a tremendous amount of ethic and ethical and legal questions related to electronic contract tracking or tracking. Um, and, and not just with COVID-19, but in general, right? How, how are our apps tracking us as we move through space? And what does that mean? Um, and, and I think when we add in this added level, this is a health, um, a health related outcome. This is a health crisis. These ethical and legal questions become even more important and more difficult and challenging um, for the implementation of these technologies. 
there's also deep socioeconomic and technology biases that occur in our populations. Um, smartphones are not generally, um, not everybody has a smartphone, <laughs> right? And in fact, the lower socioeconomic groups and the individuals with technology literacy issues like our elderly tend to be the ones that don't have and use these. And these are our most vulnerable populations for COVID-19. So this is a real challenge. Um, there's also rural and urban inequalities. Um, in my state, in Ohio, we have the rural Appalachia South and the, um, um, the ability to use cell phones in many of these areas um, is non-existent or very, very challenging. Final slide, please. So, um, you know, I come back to this digital contact tracing being a vast um, improvement over the way that we're doing contact tracing now in terms of for COVID-19, given the way the disease spreads. But I always have to ask, will it work? Um, and so far, what we've seen is there's been widespread problems with adoption, effectiveness, and data privacy. Um, we've seen in our own country, um, Utah made an effort to do it, and they um, essentially had to pull it out. Um, Texas made an effort to have a digital contact tracing app, um, and there were all sorts of holdups, um, delays in, in rolling it out, and the technology involves to privacy concerns and consumer groups suing over privacy. Um, Norway uh, suspended their use. The UK opened one. They had a fiasco. Um, they had to shut it down again, and they had to restart. So by and large, this has not been a success at this point in time. Next slide. So just to sum up, um, for airborne diseases like COVID-19, incorporating geographic location into contact tracing is really important for curving the spread of the disease. And con digital contact tracing and using apps that, that um, um, try to incorporate place and space and geography hold a tremendous amount of promise, but they've encountered such wide range of, of barriers in a, to adoption. Um, so I do believe that traditional contact tracing needs to include a thorough review of mobility and geographic location. And I, and I think that there's technologies out, out there that can help us, but that we have not effectively been able to harness and use that um, for the current pandemic crisis that we're in. Thank you very much, I'll end there. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you, Mary. Uh, we are going to uh, get into the QA session. Uh, there are a few questions posted and um, uh, my request to the rest of the listeners or participants is um, keep the QA box um, flowing and I'll try to quickly, we have about um, seven minutes for QA. So let me um, pick the first question and I'm not really sure who that is intended for, but I'm going to guess Mary. Uh, what program are you able to use to blend geography or place and network analysis? Or maybe it's for both. I'm guessing it's for Mary. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, we're not looking um, we, I don't have an answer for that question, but I bet no. Elizabeth does. Yeah, I might. no, I, I kind of do. So, so this com this co the conversation of how do we blend geography and social networks into into understanding networks as a whole? Some of the work that we've been doing is essentially trans uh, is using the social network analysis tools. So it would be the software where you, you basically are creating um, matrices of how kind of think about it as a matrix of every person and every person. And if they have a social contact, right, you can designate that. And you can use a similar technology with geography, right? So you have every person and every person that's in this app. And you can say, okay, well, who has actually been in geographic proximity? And you can create a network that way. Um, and so what we've really been doing is actually harnessing the social network analysis tools and trans transforming our geography into a network right, network geographies, and then running very similar analysis on that. And so that's the way we've coped with it. I, I have to say, it's kind of an area in its infancy in geography, sort of this geosocial spatial network, <laughs> if you want to come up with a name for it. Um, and so far, we've been borrowing from our sociology friends on how to work with that. Thank you. Um, let me see. Uh, one quick question was, um, 
are there known results of these apps in Australia and Asia? So yes, I, we have definitely seen great success in South Korea. Um, I think they're the big success story. They were very effective at getting an app up and running in South Korea. Um, a very widespread adoption. I've heard something like 70 or 80% of the population has an app on their phone. It's all the same app. Um, and, 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 um, and as you see, South Korea managed to basically quash this disease in a pretty short period of time. So there haven't been any, I would say, um, empirically rigorous studies that sort of um, uh, test the effectiveness of this technology versus something else. But we have um, uh, correlative evidence, perhaps I should say, that in, in, in countries where this has been widespread and adopted and well used and done correctly, we've seen a dramatic decline in effectiveness um, of the contact tracing and reducing disease. Great, um, there's a one, uh, question that maybe um, you can provide perspective, uh, both of you, which is um, the obvious question of, you know, um, the ethics for the authority who collects these kinds of data sets. So, um, you know, somebody in the, you know, position of power, if it's dominated by government officials, uh, how can we ensure that it's not misused or abused? Well, that seems to be the huge question, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the apps are developed by the private sector um, and they have access to the data. And then even the interface between government and private sector hasn't been smooth. Um, so um, actually on one level, I think the public is right that there's not a real um, uh, privacy is not secure. And I think that's where the reluctance is. And in the US context, I think we're just in such a polarized state that it makes it, the trust is so low that um, maybe it's not the same in South Korea. Um, you know, I, that question reminds me that there is also another issue is that, you know, is, is this something that you could potentially see down the road as being privatized? Um, we know that the, uh, the auto insurance company collects data and, and the incentive is you get a discount in your policy premium if you are you know, going by the laws and the rules and not speeding. Mm -hmm. um, do, do any of you want to comment on the, in the role of private sector in here? Do you see that the health insurance companies requiring you or expecting you or incentivizing your participation in contact tracing for a hefty or a sizable discount in your premium? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've seen a model of that in the past. Um, there's a lot, there are actually quite a few health um, insurance companies or companies like OSU, where I'm at, that uh, provide an incentive if you wear a fitness tracker, right? And you monitor how much exercise you're getting. Um, I actually don't know how effective those have been um, and whether or not there's, I mean, I know a lot of people who do it, and, and you get a reduction in your premium or you get um, you know, money in your health savings account or whatnot. Um, this is a public health crisis that needs to extend beyond private insurers. Mm -hmm. um, they're a patchwork, they're a network, they're not a safety net. And so in my opinion, this is something that needs to be rolled out and, and you know, whatever by our state and our federal public health agencies. Like that's totally my opinion, but this is, this is a true public health crisis like we've never seen. Um, there's one related question uh, that I think is interesting is um, how do you do this in an environment like Africa where you may not have enough Bluetooth penetration? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, we, we know the data for South Africa are not, it's not good. And maybe it would, it's worse in other places just because there's not the testing, but it, but it is instructive to look at uh, Ebola in mm -hmm. that it was a highly contagious disease. But it, again, it happened in a remote area that wasn't as well connected to the world as Wuhan obviously was. Um, and yet there was from, uh, you know, a range of technology, low tech from, uh, you know, I was, people described having pins on the board of a map, you know, little red pins and green pins and marking where infected areas to respond. 
Um, but I, it took an enormous effort from the international community and cooperation. Um, and right now, since it is a pandemic, it's everywhere. I, I think there's a great concern that that cooperation won't, won't, and the resources won't be there. Okay, unfortunately, you know, this is such an interesting and, and topic and there's a, both of you have spent an enormous amount of time um, telling us about your perspective and, and there are 21 questions and we possibly, I wish we had enough time to go through this. Uh, we may be able to capture these questions and send it to the two of you. And there are some questions that are specifically uh, targeted for one of the two. Mm -hmm. And maybe you will take time to um, respond to them. Um, and uh, I will encourage the participants to contact Mary and Elizabeth directly. They're easily findable on the web and, and their yeah. university's uh, sites uh, and have them this question. So thank you again, Mary and Elizabeth for taking the time and thank you everyone for um, uh, tuning in today and participating in these discussions. And I would also like to thank the organizers, the Geographical Sciences Committee and the National Academy staff for um, making this thing happen. So thank you again, and we will sign off. Thank you. Thank you everybody.